This is where machine learned force fields come into picture. We have a very simple graph here, with accuracy along the x-axis and computational cost along the y-axis. Density functional theory offers very high accuracy in general, but it is very expensive for large system sizes. Classical force field, on the other hand, is very efficient for large system sizes, but not as accurate as DFT. So this is where machine learned force field brings the best of both worlds. They offer a initial accuracy at the cost of classical simulations. As an example, a 96-atom Hafnia system took about 3.5 hours to complete 50 molecular dynamic steps when using density functional theory, whereas the machine learned force field, which is the MTP here, took only 10 seconds, which is comparable to the time taken by a classical force field. Classical force fields are also very difficult to train in the first place, and including additional elements into a pre-existing force field is non-trivial. Machine learned force fields, on the other hand, can be trained to compute DFT data of multi-element systems quite easily, and including additional elements into a pre-existing training dataset is quite trivial. In a simple form, the machine learned force field can be considered as a structure property relationship model. The only difference here is that the property is not a single valued object but rather a complex three n dimensional potential energy surface. The structures could be any atomic scale model, it could be an interface, a bulk material, molecule, or a 2D material, it really doesn't matter. And the property is actually the density functional theory based energy, forces, and stresses corresponding to the geometries that we use. Now, these DFT data points correspond to a particular point in the potential energy surface. So, once we provide enough number of data points, then the machine learning algorithm interpolates between them. Using some algorithm it could be linear regression, nonlinear regression, or neural networks, it's up to the choice of the user. The main difference between classical force fields and machine learning force fields is this. We don't provide any interaction potential functional forms to machine learned force field. It learns it by itself by following the density functional theory data that we provide it. Now let's look at the reason why we chose moment tensor potentials for quantum ATK. Let's look at the graph on the left hand side. Here, many different machine learning force fields in the market are compared. This is taken from a paper that's authored by the inventors of the respective machine learned force fields themselves, so it is as unbiased as it can get. In this graph, we have computational costs along the x-axis and accuracy along the y-axis. So to be a cost-effective model, it has to be at the bottom left corner. You can see how MTP marked by the diamond symbol is completely blanketing the left flank. This means this offers good balance between efficiency and accuracy when compared to all other models out there in the market. It uses linear regression which is very quick to evaluate and it's also efficient for large systems. Many body descriptions are available which can be tuned for higher accuracy or lower cost. It is already enabled for multi-elemental systems so we won't be bothered by the curse of dimensionality here. A dedicated webinar on the MTP framework in Quantum ATK is available via this link. Without going into too many details, here is a recipe for batch learning. We start with the system of interest that we would like to simulate. Then, the first step is to prepare representative geometries of the system, termed as training configurations. The next step is to perform a single point density functional theory calculation to obtain the energies forces and stresses of the selected configurations. Now we have both geometries and properties to fit a machine learning algorithm. For an MTP, this is a linear regression model. This model represents a continuous potential energy surface which can be employed in a molecular dynamic simulation. When doing batch training, however, the training data is fixed and it is possible that we might have missed to include certain important geometries in the training configurations and our potential energy surface may not be stable during a molecular dynamics run. 
This is where the active learning comes in. As soon as batch learning on the initial training data is completed and we have an initial moment tensor potential, it can be employed in an active learning molecular dynamic simulation. During this molecular dynamics run, a quantity called extrapolation grade is computed at user-defined intervals. This quantity measures how different is the current snapshot compared to the rest of the training dataset. If the MD snapshot is within the sample training data, then the extrapolation grade will be zero. When the extrapolation grade goes beyond a certain threshold value, the molecular dynamics will be stopped and the unique geometries from the extrapolated snapshots will be selected and added to the training dataset after performing single point DFT calculations on them. Then, another improved moment tensor potential is fitted and employed in another active learning molecular dynamics run. This process is performed several times in an iterative fashion until the molecular dynamics run completes without reaching the extrapolation grade threshold. This ensures that the MTP will be stable in the molecular dynamics run at a given condition. Active learnings can be performed for different temperatures, pressures to ensure transferability. So no computationally expensive ab initio molecular dynamics is needed in this approach. Recently, we have introduced multiple runners in the active learning process, so the users can now set up multiple molecular dynamics runs within a single active learning process. This means you can sample the configurational space of your system much more efficiently and improve the MTP at a faster rate. Historically, ab initio molecular dynamics was used to sample reference configurations for machine learned force field generation. In this slide, we are going to show why such an approach is not needed anymore. For a fixed system size, an ab initio MD can propagate the system for a set amount of time using a set amount of computational effort. It is not practical to sample all relevant regions of the configurational space within a reasonable amount of time using a Binisho MD. Moreover, when we are doing equilibrium molecular dynamics, many of the snapshots will be duplicates, so they cannot be used in the training dataset. In Quantum ATK, we use tailored random structure generation protocols to efficiently sample the configurational space of interest for any given system. This way, we generate the reference configurations almost effortlessly. There is, however, a computational overhead involved in generating the DFT reference data. But once that is there, fitting an MTP is also relatively effortless. Following that, an active learning molecular dynamics using the initial moment tensor potential costs only as much as a classical simulation. Ab initio calculations are only needed when new geometries are identified in the active learning. This way, one can reach longer simulation times and also improve the moment tensor potential in one go. Now let's take a peek under the hood and see how moment tensor potentials are formulated. The total energy of the system is written as the sum of atomic energy contributions. This is the approach that's used in most machine learned force fields out in the market. Atomic energy is not a physical quantity, but it is just a mathematical construct that's needed for the regression algorithm. Every atom in the system is represented by its atomic environment within a cutoff sphere of a user chosen radius. For any atom I in the system, there are J neighbors which are distributed within the cutoff sphere. For interpolation, the Cartesian information is not very useful in representing the geometries because they are not invariant to symmetry operations. Thus, we need a rotationally, translationally and permutationally invariant representation to represent the atomic configurations. These are called descriptors in the machine learned force field terminology. Here, we use moment tensors which consist of radial and angular components. For every neighbor atom in an atomic environment, a set of radial functions and a tensor of rank nu are applied. Then these tensors are contracted to form scalar basis functions. 
Users can specify the number of basis functions to use and the corresponding moment tensors will be set up automatically. Also, the basis functions are used in a linear combination in the regression procedure as shown here. It is this equation that gives rise to the atomic energy contribution to the total energy of the system. The coefficient z's that are shown here are the fitting parameters in the linear regression. After the fitting, the number of basis functions used and their coefficients make up the MTP parameter set. As mentioned in the previous slide, users can choose the number of basis functions to train a moment tensor potential. A wrong choice here would lead to overfitting or underfitting, two of the outcomes that we would like to avoid at all costs. Let's see what this means in practice. Let's focus on the graph to the left now. Along the y-axis, we have the root mean squared values of the trained moment tensor potential with respect to the density functional theory data. Along the x-axis, we have the number of basis functions used. There are two sets of data points here, one for the fitting, another for the prediction dataset. The optimal number of basis functions will depend on the complexity of the system that's currently under study. For a simple system like a molecule, a small number of basis functions will usually suffice. For a more complex system, like the amorphous configurations or polymers, a large number of basis functions may be required. In this example, we see that both fitting and prediction errors are large for small basis set. This is the classical case of underfitting. In this graphic, we see how the model is very simplistic and completely off when compared to the underlying data. On the other hand, an extremely large basis set leads to overfitting. This is the case when the fitting errors are super low, but the prediction errors are much higher. In this graphic, we see that the model is going through every single training data point, leaving a large discrepancy along the interpolation regions. An optimal basis set is one that gives roughly the same root mean squared error value in both fitting and prediction data sets and this can be obtained by carefully tuning the basis functions and getting the right number.